So do we just do radio silence while people? <laughs> yes, people are joining. We you have the tally. Moment. <laughs> uh, that's kind of interesting experience. Yeah. yeah, we'll get started in just a moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday virtual field trip offered by Washington's National Park Fund. Today, we'll be traveling over to Olympic National Park to learn about the Olympic marmot monitoring using citizen scientists with Patty Happy. My name is Beth Gloston, and it is my pleasure to join you here today. I'm a board member for Washington's National Park Fund, or WNPF, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Before we get started on our program, I wanna give just a little bit of information about the fund. Uh, the organization was founded in 1993 with the goal of supporting our amazing national parks in our state, Olympic, Mount Rainier, and North Cascades. The organization is supported by a 20 person board of directors that's very involved with its activities, as well as a seven person, um, very capable staff led by our CEO, Lori Ward. The organization works uh, directly with the superintendent of each park to identify priority projects each year uh, that we then fund through your donations. And for those of you who have recently contributed to the fund, thank you so much. W In fact, WNPF has uh, been a supporter of this project we'll hear about today since its inception um, over 10 years ago. Supporting these projects um, is, it is our goal to keep our national parks strong, vibrant, healthy, youthful, and everlasting so that we can enjoy them now um, as well as future generations. We started doing these virtual field trips in March as the pandemic uh, shut everything down and we were unsure about how much we'd be able to get out to enjoy these parks. So we thought, well, let's bring the parks to you. And we've continued to do so. And as winter descends, again, it's another opportunity to make sure you stay in connection with our national parks. This program today will run until 12.45. Um, there'll be a speaker until about uh, 12.35, after which we'll have time to answer your questions. So if, if you have questions come up during the presentation, please enter them into the um, Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. There's also a box to access closed captioning, which you can do if that would assist your enjoyment today. So grab your lunch, let's hop on the Zoom bus and travel over to Olympic National Park. And as we head there, I'm going to give you a little information about our speaker. So Patty Happy is the Wildlife Branch Chief at Olympic National Park. She has been working in her current position for over 20 years, but she first started at Olympic National Park in the 1980s when she did her PhD research on the relationship between elk and deer and old growth forests in the Ho. Over the years, she has been privileged to work on a variety of, as she describes as really cool projects, including <laughs> fishers, amphibians, and bears. And in fact, we've heard from Patty in early virtual field trips as she described uh, the mountain goat project at Olympic National Park in April and the fishers, introducing the fishers to Olympic National Park in March. So if you're interested, you can go back and watch those uh, field trips through our website. But she says this marmot monitoring uh, project is one of the most rewarding for her personally. So Patty, take it away. Thank you. So I think if we can hop to the slides. There, whoop, there we go. I don't see the PowerPoint. Is the PowerPoint up? So welcome everybody. Um, I am going to um, hopefully stay on time and leave plenty of time for questions because what is most rewarding about this program for me is this is really all about um, the citizen scientists and I have a lot of folks that volunteer to help pull this program off um, for over 10 years now. So I'm hoping 
to have time to answer any of your questions or just get your feedbacks on this program. Um, it is um, from the title slide, we're talking about the Olympic Marmot and this program is supported uh, principally by Washington's National Park Fund since 2009, um, but also um, from Olympic National Park and the US Forest Service. Next slide, please. And I think we're gonna go into a video that more better than I can give you understanding of uh, just kind of the natural history of this species. When morning comes to the high meadows of the Olympic mountains, the sharp whistle of the Olympic marmot may be heard echoing across the valley. Their shrill call serves as an early warning system to alert colony members of approaching danger. These marmots are the size of large cats and just as curious. Their closest relatives are prairie dogs and ground squirrels. A marmot's coat color is a mix of golden brown, chocolate, and silver gray with variable amounts of blonde hairs. Age groups have characteristic coloration, and the molt tends to significantly darken the individuals. Individuals can be identified by variation in coat patterns. After emerging from hibernation, they live in colonies consisting of many burrows. These multi-purpose structures are used for hibernation, protection from bad weather and predators, and to raise newborn pups. Feeding all summer on sed shoots, the succulent part of herbaceous plants and flowers, the Olympic marmots start to enter hibernation in early September. At this time, marmots will stay in their burrows for a few consecutive days, with only brief outings that allow for a little foraging. Marmots do not eat during hibernation, so they have to store fat before becoming inactive. Once the animal goes into torpor, their digestive system shuts down completely. They will lose half their body mass over the winter. The body temperature of a hibernating marmot drops to less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and their heart rate may drop to three beats per minute. Every two weeks, the animal shivers and increases heart rate and body temperature to normal to come out of torpor. Experts have no conclusive answer as to why. Adults emerge in late April to early May, typically males first. Mid-June, pups are born in burrow and emerge mid-July. A marmot's day is spent nuzzling, playing, chirping, and feeding together. This daily life also includes keeping a constant watchful eye out for land predators, as well as raptors. Marmots do not have sweat glands, so they have no way to disperse heat. And because the animal has sparse fur on its belly, they will always find time to just lay on snow, a flat rock, or on bare dirt to cool itself. The Olympic marmot is quite possibly one of the most social and gregarious mammals in the park. They are endemic to the Olympic Peninsula, meaning they are found nowhere else in the world. Many, many thanks to John Guzman for allowing us to share this video. Um, so I think we'll go to the polls first, um, just to kind of get kind of settled on the species and um, how much, so it, it kind of goes to the biology and the program, monitoring program, um, is how many litters do you think marmots have a year? Um, you know, they are a member of the rodent family. And if you, you know, start off with a male and a female mouse in the beginning of the year, you often end up with a thousand mice, but come fall. But what do you think happens with marmots? And I cannot see what the vote is. So I'll rely on the program managers to tell me when to stop the poll.
I think everybody's voted by now. Oh, yep, just about everybody's got it right. It's actually one max. And actually, it's often less than that on any given year, depending upon what the weather's like, between only 15 to up to 50% of females breed each year. Next poll, please. So given that they only have one litter a year, what is the average litter size of a marmot? What does everybody think? Is it one and a half, three and a half, five and a half, or up to seven and a half? It does vary, and I know they don't have half of a kit, but this is just kind of um, based on over several years of focused research uh, monitoring the species. This is what uh, Sue Cox Griffin found when she did her project up uh, working in the northeastern corner of the park where she had some animals that she followed uh, extensively. Actually, the average is three and a half, so it's pretty close. But the point is, is that, you know, for a species that breeds maybe every other year, they don't have a lot of pups when they breed. And then also, you know, females don't reach breeding age until they're um, three or four years old. Next slide, please. So in looking at that, you know, the Olympic marmot has characteristics that make them exceptionally vulnerable. So we're concerned about the species. They're only found in the Olympic mountains. So I feel them personally as my personal responsibility. There are not a lot of them and they do have this infrequent reproduction. So it takes a long time for the population to grow or recover from something that will knock them down. Next slide, please. So the distribution of marmot habitat is also uh, fairly limited. Um, they're restricted to the alpine and subalpine habitats on the Olympic Peninsula, over 90% of it, of which is in the park. And that's shown here in kind of the blue highlighted areas. You can see it's the ridge lines. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a shot of the habitat you know, which they live and they're, they inhabit these open meadows, which are kind of also fragmented by patches of inhospitable habitat like rocks and, and areas where tree line is encroaching. Next slide, please. And if you look at it, this is a shot, um, not a, of fog coming in. It just kind of shows if you're a marmot looking out across the habitat in which you live in the Olympic range, there's a lot of inhospitable area in between from you to go from one habitat patch from another to disperse if you're a young individual. Um, so that gets us to our next poll, which when the marmot um, kits finally do leave home, how far do they travel? And we'll just focus on females because males and females travel differently. And this gets into dispersal distance. So if there is something that happens to a marmot colony and one colony winks out, um, how far away, how far does uh, dispersing marmot have to travel to recolonize that habitat patch? Okay, this is kind of a harder question. And this is on average, there are some exceptions and especially like mo a lot of females don't leave home at all, they stay close to mom. And then we also have uh, some that travel pretty far. And the ones that hitch a ride in your car, they're not counted in this. And we have had a couple of that, especially last year. The average distance actually for a female is that second one, 267 meters. So you know, that just kind of goes to show that um, the habitat where these uh, critters are located, it's, it's fragmented, it's restricted to high elevation areas. So it's hard for them to disperse naturally. And then they don't actually have a very hard uh, dispersal distance. So um, if a population winks out locally, if a habitat patch becomes unoccupied, unless it's connected to something adjacent to it, it is really hard for that habitat patch to get reoccupied. Next slide, please. So when research started here in the park on marmots by primarily by Sue Cox Griffin and then also Julie Witzek, um, in the early 2000s, they found that about 40% of the colonies that were historically occupied um, were vacant or extinct by 2006. So that raised our concern. And then while, during the course of that study, the population continued to decline in some places actually fairly rapidly. And it was, this decline was driven by a decline in the female uh, portion of the population. 
And um, this is a concern because we know that females have to reach a, uh, at least three years to reach sexual maturity. And then if, a, if they wink out in one of the colony patches, they, they're not very good dispersers. Next slide, please. So predation by coyotes was actually the cause of the decline and they're not native to the Olympic Peninsula. They moved in following the extirpation of the wolf. Um, and through some pretty ingenious studies of collecting coyote scats and looking at then hair and DNA of what they're eating, they determined that they were a major predator of uh, marmots throughout the park. And if we backed out the marmot predation uh, that was due to coyotes, the population actually would be stable. Next slide, please. So we had concerned about actually the possible extinction of the marmot population. And so I asked those researchers to please design some type of um, system for monitoring marmots that could inform management action because I was afraid we would have to intervene, but we needed to keep track of what was going on with the population. But we don't have a lot of financial resources to do um, a monitoring program. And it's, since the marmots are out in the open and places that people like to visit, I thought we could design a citizen science monitoring program, which would then be sustainable for us to keep going in the long run. Next slide, please. So uh, Julia did this as part of her thesis. And so the program that we're doing has actually been researched and vetted and been through peer review um, and, and um, was, was ground tested before we actually started implementing it with the citizen science. And we had a pilot year in 2009, worked out the tweaks. Next slide, please. And kind of hit the ground running in 2010 and have been doing it since then. Um, with the help of National, uh, Washington's National Park Fund, uh, grew in some folks to help me design uh, a web page that's hosted on the Olympic National Parks website. And that's where you go to get background information on the program um, and figure out if this is a good fit for you and then, and then um, apply to be a marmot monitor. Um, each year I take between 70 to 100 volunteers. Um, they go out in groups of two to six. Um, and it's a pretty popular program with folks who do participate. Uh, most of my folks that come uh, do participate are returnees. So I know we've kind of reached that sweet spot of what is doable and fun. Um, and I have a couple of hardy folks that have come back every <laughs> all 10 years and participated in the program. But this has been a huge asset to wildlife management in Olympic National Park. There's been over 35,000 volunteer hours um, associated with this. Next slide, please. So the monitoring program design is, is fairly straightforward. We're not counting marmots because that's hard to do. What we are doing is going to patches of marmot habitat, those blue areas that I showed on the map, and just figuring out if marmots are there or not. And this is called occupancy monitoring. So we're actually tracking changes in habitat occupancy over time, not the numbers of animals. And to kind of look at, to get a uh, confidence interval and an error term associated this with that with the, for the statistics. Some patches are visited more than once a year, but most of them are visited only once. Next slide, please. So and we can't go everywhere um, and a lot of the park is inaccessible. So the program that Julia designed basically clustered patches of habitat together. Um, and we, then we looked at those patches of habitat that were accessible with the trail system. And they're, um, kind of those are those different habitat patches that we're monitoring are kind of highlighted here on this map. And then groups of adjacent habitat patches are grouped together and we call them TRIPS. Next slide, please. So when you sign up for the program, groups sign up for a trip. They tell me which are their top three. And the TRIPS can vary in difficulty and actually location from two day trips, which are basically the front country around Hurricane Ridge and the visitor center to seven to eight day trips that are deep in the park's back country. Next slide, please. So each trip is, as I said, uh, consists of several clusters of this marmot habitat. And we're, for example, here, we're looking at the trip that goes to Royal Basin, which I think a lot of folks are familiar with. So the Royal Basin trip has four clusters of marmot habitat. 
that the folk survey and in each cluster is then further subdivided into habitat units. So down on the bottom, the deception cluster has two habitat units. And it's these habitat units that are the bread and butter of the monitoring program. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when you sign up to be a participate in this, um, all volunteer, all new volunteers um, have to attend a day long training. And in non COVID years, that's one half of the days in the classroom. And then we go out in the field and actually uh, walk through how you do a survey in the field. Next slide, please. And then the following day after the training, your next step is to hike to your, your center of your trip and then hike to the habitat cluster uh, where you're going to be surveying for the day and then figure out what unit you're in. And that's kind of the steps there. You can see folks hiking. And these are all pictures from my volunteers over the years who kindly shared pictures of themselves doing the field work. Gives you kind of a field for the variety of habitats that folks are working in. Next slide, please. And then once you are in the unit, uh, you look to see, are there marmots here or not this year? And the first step is just scanning the area out with binoculars. This is a great slide that was prepared uh, years ago by John Guzman, the guy who did the film, and shows um, uh, indications of marmot occupancy in one unit. Next slide, please. So sometimes they're hard to find. Can anybody see the marmot in this picture? It's not all marmots out in the meadow. Next slide. Yep, sometimes I like to hang out in scree fields. So uh, some places are, are easier to find marmots than others. So next slide, please. And if you don't find marmots, then the, what we train people to do is look for um, their burrows because they don't move. So were they here this year or not? Uh, and the, another way to determine that is to find a burrow. Next slide, please and assess whether it has been used this year or not. And the key signs that we look for are fresh feces in the burrow or a kicked up dirt or flattened out vegetation. Next slide, please. Or you could find a burrow, but we have these key indicators that it is not used this year and we call that abandoned habitat. So you find a burrow, but there's no fresh dirt, there's no feces, the vegetation is not flattened down. Those are the key things that we look for. Next slide, please. Next step is fill out data form. I love data, data is all important. Next slide, please. And this shows one of our current data sheets. Um, this is the stuff that I asked the volunteers to um, fill out and hand back to me. And we collect data two ways. We have the paper forms that we send out and then we also have data recorded on GPSs. And that's what you see one of the volunteers doing right now is when you walk through the patches of habitat, the GPS records the pathway that you're going. So I can figure out which pieces of the, of the unit were surveyed. And then when marmots are found or burrs are found, the volunteers or the, the citizen scientists then mark those waypoints and then back on the GPS and then back up um, that data by also writing it down just in case batteries fail or GPSs get lost. And so this is an actual data, well, it's a mocked up data sheet, but it looks, this is what I get back. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of a survey that one of my long-term volunteers did uh, years ago when they surveyed uh, the trip that includes Heart Lake and Swing Bear Lake. Um, it's the kind of teal line is their track line that shows me which units they got to survey and which ones they didn't. And then the green dots are where they found occupied burrows. The red dots are abandoned burrows that they marked. There's more there, you don't have to mark all of them. And then where they saw a marmot is kind of got that little yellow marmoty figure. So this is how the data comes back to me. Next slide, please. And this shows um, back to the Royal Basin, uh, two different surveys, I had two different groups go one year. One group was in the green line and one group was in the blue line. And you can kind of see that people choose different paths in some ways to kind of approach a survey in a unit, um, but they all get it done in their own way. Next slide, please. So these are the results that we have so far. Next slide, please. So, I'm going to, these slides are all going to, I'm going to show you several maps and they're all going to have the same format um, over the years. And this is the first year that we did the survey. 
Um, the green dots show where surveyors went and they found marmots, either saw a marmot or they found an occupied burrow. Um, the orange dots show where they found abandoned burrows, but no sign of marmot use that year. The red dots show where they surveyed the complete unit and they found no signs of marmot. So that's abandoned habitat. Uh, I mean, that's no sign at all. Um, sometimes people don't, don't get to cover the complete survey unit. So that we do get some incomplete surveys and not every, all areas are surveyed every year. So this shows the extent of the surveys um, that we're covering. And you can see we're covering the entire park just about where we have trails and is accessible. This is how the program started out. Although some areas have a greater survey effort than others, we have a lot of survey effort in the northern part of the park in the northeast, but that's where the majority of the marmot habitat is. And you can also see in this that in the northeast, there's a lot more green dots than there are is in the southwest. That particular year in the Skyline Trail, no marmots were found. And also in the southeast, there are some green dots, there were some marmots that were found, but there was a lot of abandoned habitat found. So this is what we're tracking as it changes over the years. Next slide, please. This is just, um, I can't, not showing all the years. This is a 2015 survey. And you can see that we're still not seeing marmots uh, in Skyline and in the southeast. There's an increase in the number of orange dots and, and less of the green dots over the year but the central portion of the park in the Northeast is holding firm. Also in 2012, I wanna point out that we added areas outside the park, the Forest Service joined in um, in the effort. And with the addition of Forest Service lands in 2012, we actually are now serving the entire species range. Uh, next slide, please. So I took a break in 2015 to, um, after the 2015 survey, and worked with a statistician named is Rebecca McCaffrey to do an analysis of the data uh, uh, to see, are we getting meaning, well, first of all, what are the trends? And also, are we getting meaningful data? Because um, I just didn't want to keep on doing this if it wasn't going to return data that the park could use to make management decisions on if we needed to. And so, um, Rebecca, this shows the, the Black line on the bottom is just kind of the naive occupancy. So about 50, less than 50% of all the habitat units that were surveyed, just the raw data says that they were occupied. We work in the error terms with the repeat surveys and it gives you a confidence interval. And it shows that those are actually pretty tight. Um, and it, um, so it was really, this is returning good data that we can detect trends with. Uh, so we decided to keep it going. It also shows that the, over the six years that we've been monitoring, um, the occupancy has been relatively stable. So those trends that Sue um, and her crew uh, observed in the 2000s were not continuing as far as we can tell. So the population declined, but then stabilized, albeit at low numbers. So given this analysis in, in 2017, uh, we kicked up the program again and started it. And next slide, please. Oh, forgot. One of the things that we also were able to look at was then uh, the trends in, in or the average occupancy by region. And you can see that um, there is a higher percentage of the habitat is occupied as you know, the raw data on the map is, is coming over um, to the, the actual analysis. So yes, indeed, um, the Northeast has a higher level of occupancy than, than the Southeast does. The Southwest, I have so little sampling effort there that we really can't test out changes there over time um, and as with uh, the Forest Service. But the Southeast, we could do more with, but I need to kind of hone down those confidence intervals. But there's definitely looks like different things are going on in different portions of the park that um, we need to pay attention to. Next slide, please. So we started up in 2017 uh, when folks started start shining up for the program. I'm like, I've started forcing more of the survey effort you know, down in the Southeast so we can look at trends a little better there and dropped from the areas that we survey every year. Um, uh, so the areas in the Northeast where we had enough coverage. So this is the results of the 2017 survey. And then I think I have one more slide just shows what we had last year. Next slide, yep. So um, 
we did have a survey effort uh, last year, even in the time of COVID, um, mainly with returnees. Um, it was, you know, very little contact with folks just kind of handed their gear and ran. And then the new folks that showed up this year, we just did kind of a one-on-one -on -one training um, in the field. Next slide, please. So there are um, some sites that we survey every year. They're the core sites that I want to compare apples to apples. And they tend to have um, higher Mormon occupancy. It's not quite the range-wide effort. But this is what I eyeball each year. And you can see that it looked like in 2017 that we had an increase, but then the numbers have last year declined to kind of stable uh, where we started off with. I am going to be working with Rebecca. She has the data right now. We're going to see if this trend was real or not, or if it's just we have too much variation to, to kind of tease this out. Next slide, please. So I am going to be doing a further analysis on the trend, and we'll kind of keep on going with that. But the other value of this, this program is that it's really good foundational data for further in-depth analysis of what's going on with marmots. For example, um, Maya Murphy Williams is somebody that worked at, started off with me as a volunteer and she actually was the recipient of the Carolyn Dobbs Award years ago. She took this uh, citizen science data and then augmented it with more in-depth investigations, looking at the relation, more fine tail, really fine scale relationships of where marmots are and where occupied burrows are and are not in relating to habitat characteristics. And that showed that um, some of the key things that popped out were um, higher proportion of meadow versus rock and also um, a higher visibility. They actually got down at marmot levels and figured how far could a marmot see. So that information helps us if we're gonna do any interventions, it's targeted, it targets um, specific areas that are more likely to support marmots than others. Next slide, please. And you know, her data show that the bigger uh, opening and more meadows in the areas are gonna be more important and support greater marmots um, than other areas that are rocky or smaller. So how do we maintain uh, open habitat in a time of climate change where we have tree line encroachment in these subalpine meadows? Well, one of the things that's happening is we're having a higher fire return. So um, we are able to add an area of marmot habitat that did burn fairly recently, the Hayes Fire, to our uh, monitoring program. And we're wrapping that in. We've had two years of surveys in that area right now. So the program's been going since 2010, but it's constantly evolving um, and also kind of feeding into further, uh, more focused research. Next slide, please. And I believe that that is all I have, there's a lot more information on the web page, including scientific publications and all of my annual reports. But I just want to thank everybody who has enabled us to do this program, particularly the, the photos. These are not mine. They're the volunteers and also Rick Clawwater, who is a marmot aficionado, and John Guzman. Uh, the GIS is Kathy Braun. Um, again, Rebecca did the analysis. My crew helps out quite a bit, but mainly the Park Fund for 10 years of support and all the volunteers that have donated all the hours to make this happen because it would not happen without, without all of them. I'm just, I'm just the conductor. <laughs> and with that, I'll leave it open for questions. Wow, I'm on time. <laughs> Unusual. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Patty, for that summary of this volunteer program, monitoring program of marmots. Um, and I wanted to start with one uh, question first. So if, if I were interested in volunteering for this program, what, what would I expect? What, what do I need to bring? To so um, we supply you with a bear canister and um, we give you the backcountry permits and a park pass and um, the field forms and the GPS, but all your backcountry backpacking gear, you need to supply yourself. Um, and it's not for everyone. Um, I know that the pictures kind of show gentle meadows, but a lot of the marmot habitat is steep. Um, and so you have to be comfortable that if you see in the application, I ask how comfortable are you uh, traversing steep terrain and orienting off trail because this is the one time where we say go off trail and hike in meadows. So. Okay, great. Thank you. And we have 
have, have a couple of questions actually one um, set that was emailed to us before in advance mm -hmm. of the presentation from Tara who asks how long do marmots live and do they mate for life so we do have some information, you know, with Sue's research, she actually had animals tagged. And I believe that one we know lived as long as 12 years. Um, I don't know if that's the upper end, but that seems to be pretty old and that's the longest that we know. Um, not necessarily mate for life per se, but in an established colony, there is a dominant male and a dominant female that normally do the breeding. There may be two females in there, um, but they, once they're adults and, and that's their colony, they stay in that colony for life. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, a couple other questions. Mark asks, if wolves ever make it to Olympic National Park, will they prey on marmots? Um, or do the marmots live at higher elevation? And then a uh, follow-up to that, um, or would the wolves keep the coyotes in balance? How might that work? Yeah, I, you know, it is speculation because we don't have wolves here now, but based on experience in Yellowstone and other areas and knowing what wolves normally eat, their primary prey is going to be elk and deer. Um, they may occasionally uh, prey on marmots, but probably not so much, but they will de deplete the coyote population because they are direct competitors. So. Okay. Okay. Let's <laughs> I see. saw Bob's note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm looking at the notes and I'm seeing some of my volunteers are sending notes to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Anything you want to share there? <laughs> oh, just somebody saying I want to get back in. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad to have you. Come back, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good endorsement for the program. Yeah. 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 Um, another question from Janice. How do Olympic marmots differ from marmots in the Cascades? Are they the same species? They are. A, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I normally talk for three hours, <laughs> as, <laughs> as my volunteers will say. Um, so no, they are fully distinct species. They're related to the marmots in the Cascades, but they have been isolated in the Olympic Peninsula for so long that they uh, have evolved to be a fully distinct species. And there are our only um, fully distinct endemic uh, mammal species. They have a unique number of chromosomes. Um, kind of analogous situation with Vancouver Island. They have also their own unique species there. In fact, one of the reasons that kind of highlighted our concern was that um, the Vancouver Island marmot was declining to such an extent that they had to take them, all of them out of the wild and, and raise them in captivity to save that species. I'm like, oh, is that happening here? So. Okay, okay. Well, oh, uh, great that the monitoring is in place to, mm -hmm. to know about that. Um, let's see. Um, black bears on the Olympic Peninsula are not their own species. We are they're the same as the black bears everywhere. It's just that, you know, with the Olympic Peninsula being more isolated, um, like we have the same elk as everywhere else, but we have kind of our own subspecies or races. And so black bears here are a little different than everywhere else. They're only black. Whereas in the Cascade, you get them, um, you know, different colors, but no, they're the same black bear species. Okay, another question, uh, let's see, uh, from Jim asks, is there, are there any plans to remove coyotes from the habitat? Can you manage, manage the coyotes? Mm, you know, no, there aren't, mainly because, you know, if you look at efforts of coyote control elsewhere, I don't think it would be feasible. And also this is a this is a native species that invaded on their own. Um, so it's a little bit different situation. I think the best um, opportunity for at least um, mitigating the coyote impact on marmots is gonna be wolf restoration. Oh, okay, okay, very good. Um, uh, question from Rob, do the non-native mountain goats threaten the marmots by competing for the same grasses and flowers? You know, not that we've been able to determine. In order to kind of figure that out, you'd have to have some really focused research where you would have exclosures and you would you know, do detailed measurements of herbivory by the different species, kind of like what I did um, in the hoe. And that's such a variable environment up there. Um, it, it's just not something that we've been able to do. Um, I kind of suspect not just because they do hang out in, in a little bit different areas, um, but it's possible. We just we just don't have any data to support or refute that. Okay. Okay, let's see. And another um, question about, um, uh, a question when you talk about the marmots having such a 
small distance that they travel. Um, is there a problem with maintaining genetic diversity within the species? So there's all, um, there's not that I know of because there is, there's those few outliers that just travel long distances. And if you just have a few of those do it every once in a while, um, you're going to get genetic exchange. That being said, you know, it, it is an isolated species. And so um, I don't know what the current status of the genetic diversity of it is, but that's not been, I don't think there's, that's our problem. Um, because if you, the challenge with the coyote predation is that they're picking off adult females at the time of the year when they have pups at the den. So it's kind of like a four for one when they take them out and it's backing out that predation at that time of year that's going to stop the decline, the, the current decline. The, the long-term decline with climate change and tree line encroachment, that's a bigger issue. It, could you comment more about the, the impact of, of climate change on the marmots? Sure, so um, the, what we're seeing is that as the climate warms, the tree line uh, increases in elevation in the park. And with trees invading alpine meadows, that shrinks the availability of marmot habitat. And that's really when we first got concerned about this as we were looking at, are we losing habitat patches and is that impacting, impacting the animals? But with Sue's research, it said, even though we have habitat there, it's still abandoned. And you know why? It's because it's this unsustainable level of predation. Now, it may be that we, you know, we've had coyotes for a while. It may be that we have more coyotes in higher elevations foraging on marmots longer because we have declined snowpacks and they can reside up there and predate on marmots more than these do in the past. So that may be kind of a, a secondary um, early effect of climate change. Tree line encroachment is going to be a, an issue long in the long run, but right now it's that coyote predation. Okay, okay. And that would that be related to the um, more robust populations in the northern areas of the park? Yeah, I think so, because in the northern area of the park, you can see that the habitat patches are bigger and they're more contiguous. Yeah. So when a colony winks out, it can be recolonized. Yeah. And that's kind of what we've seen. There were some colonies that Sue Griffin was studying that winked out when she was there. But um, on our marmot, like, or especially the areas around the visitor center, they got recolonized. Whereas the areas further down in, in um, like Skyline that are isolated, they have kind of come in and out, but not to the scale that we're seeing in other areas. Okay, okay, great, let's see. Um, Jim asks, what impact of trails and humans um, uh, what has there been an impact of trails and humans? You know, good question. So when Sue first got here, um, they were wondering what was going on. Was it declining snowpack? Were they dying when they were hibernating? That wasn't the case. And they also, she also had an intern that looked at the effect of trails and visitors. Was there a difference in the decline in visited versus non-visited areas? And there is none. Okay. So there was no, it, there's no impacts of visitation, which is nice to know. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> is that we can go see them from afar. Right, right. And in fact, I, I often kind of think that, you know, us being there is keeping the coyotes out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Patty, for- Oh, my pleasure. Today. And, and there's one other thing that I wanted to mention about the Marmot Project, and that is um, another partner uh, in the area, which is Camaraderie Cellars, that um, they are producing a Syrah blend wine um, by the name of Chateau Marmot um, <laughs> that is available online through their cellars. And $10 from each bottle goes to support this Citizen Marmot Research Project. So I, I, I can, I happen to have, uh, there you can see the little- It's great thing. art, I love the art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the wine too. <laughs> Oh, good, good. All right. So um, again, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you again, Patty, for your, um, for sharing your knowledge about the uh, marmots in the park. I uh, oh, want to mention to everybody that in upcoming in two weeks, we'll be going to Mount Rainier National Park, where Kevin Bacher will be talking about the uh, volunteer programs there. And in 2021, we'll be continuing our programs on uh, January 6th, going to North Cascades, learning about uh, the invasive reed canary grass. Um, for these um, field trips, go to www.npf.org 
there's it is um, slash uh, backslash field trip to sign up. And also to let you know that the parks have been uh, been supported by WNPF for um, uh, by, with over $650,000 over the last year. So we'd be so grateful if you consider supporting our work um, by going to www.npf.org. Thank you. Thank you.